Hello, I'm William Zelmer, president of uh, the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. Uh, with me is Dr. Gregory Higby, executive director of the Institute. After more than 30 years in this position, uh, Greg will be retiring at the end of 2018 and take on a part-time role with the Institute as uh, its Michelle's scholar. So I'm speaking with Greg to express our appreciation on behalf of AIHB members for what he's contributed to the Institute, to the field of pharmacy, the history of pharmacy, and to ask him to reflect a bit on his career, uh, pharmacy history, and his work with AIHB. So Greg, thanks very much for agreeing to be a part of this conversation. Uh, I'd like to start just by asking you to uh, you know, I, I know there's a long legacy of pharmacy in your family. Your grandfather was a pharmacist. Your father was a pharmacist. Tell us about what their career was like in our profession. Sure, Bill. Very happy to do that. Uh, I've borne many a person with that story. But my, um, I actually, I tell my students about my grandfather because my grandfather went to pharmacy school for 90 days. Um, he started off in Battle Creek um, as an apprentice uh, there. And uh, he was told by his uncle that if he would um, finish up for, uh, his apprenticeship and uh, get his pharmacy license, that the uncle would set him up in business. My grandfather went through the four years of apprenticeship and the 90 days of pharmacy school and passed his board exam. And then went back to the uncle who then responded with, what, what are you talking about? And that was the end of that idea. And uh, he then started working uh, as a uh, employed pharmacist for uh, at that uh, for several years until he could save up money, um, moving to Wyandotte, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit, and setting up a drugstore there. And that's where my father uh, was exposed to pharmacy uh, during uh, the Depression years. Uh, my father being born in 1920, and. My father went to pharmacy school um, in Detroit uh, at Wayne and then went off and served in the Navy during World War II as a pharmacist mate. Came back, um, worked in Arizona as a pharmacist, then made his way back to Michigan, eventually um, opening up a, his own store in the small town of Bad Axe, Michigan, which is 100 miles due north of Detroit. Mm -hmm. A little nice farm town. And there, uh, with his partner, Jim Volk, he had a quite a successful business. And that's um, how I grew up, in a sense, in the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us then how uh, you migrated from, from that background uh, into the field of history of pharmacy. Well, Bill, as a, as a youth, I was very interested in history. That was my great love. And uh, I went to parochial school, and in the little library there, I in the Sacred Heart School, I read every history book I could get my hands on. Uh, that was my love as a, as a, as a youth. And I then, um, when I came time to think about college, um, I decided actually I wanted to go to pharmacy school just because I was worried about employment. And I knew pharmacy, I knew the work of being a community pharmacist. And I knew in a sense that the most important thing really was the idea of service, community service and service to those who came into the store. So I was ready to do that. And so I applied to the University of Michigan, a college of pharmacy, which was in a, a zero five program. I started right off, I walked in the first day in pharmacy school, which was very nice. I didn't have to go, I uh, didn't have to prove myself at the college level. and uh, during pharmacy school, every opportunity I had as an elective, I took a history course, and mainly ancient history of all things. And I then, after pharmacy school was finished, and I and I put in my experiential time, uh, passed my board exam, 1977. I worked a year or so and decided that I wanted to go back to um, school. Wanted to go back to university and study. The history of science of all things because my background in pharmacy school as you know Bill in those days you learned a, a great swath of science in, meta, in, um, in biology chemistry especially in physics and so I thought history of science could combine my two loves and so I came here to the was University of Wisconsin where 
I eventually learned there was a history of pharmacy program, which I didn't know when I applied. Uh, and I was recruited by John Paris Condola and Glenn Sonnedecker to study the history of pharmacy uh, here at the School of Pharmacy. So great. You arrived in Madison in 1978 to study eventually the history of pharmacy. Um, I'd appreciate if you comment a little bit on how this field, the history of pharmacy, has changed since when you first began uh, to uh, be engaged on a scholarly basis in this field. Well, Bill, that's a very good question. I can tell you that when I first arrived here in the history of pharmacy, the, uh, the traditional study of the history of pharmacy was concentrated on the making of medicines and the history of making and providing medicines to the public. Uh, topics like pharmacology, therapeutics, um, drug discovery, even to some extent drug development, uh, testing were secondary or actually thought of as being outside of the history of pharmacy. Those were history of medicine topics. And so um, that was a hot, a hot subject of debate. Um, when I first arrived, but that over the years, especially with people like John Paris Condola and others who looked at the history of pharmacology, that did expand the field, especially in the United States, um, Europe um, being a little more conservative in the history of pharmacy and having, I think, partly because they had so much more history of classical pharmacy than we did, was uh, more reluctant to uh, include those topics in the field of the history of pharmacy. Well, Greg, uh, you've already mentioned uh, Dr. Paris Condola and Dr. Sonnendecker. Uh, Dr. Sonnendecker, of course, uh, was your major professor and a former AIHP director, and he recently celebrated his 100th birthday. Uh, have there been other historians who influenced your development as a pharmacy historian? Um, Yes, Bill. Just a couple. There, there are several that I could mention. I'll mention uh, two or three. Um, of course, John Paris Gondola, uh, who helped me greatly when I was in graduate school here. When he was a, he was a professor here he was on my committee, um, did independent research with him. Um, my longtime uh, friend and colleague, John Swan, who, who was with me in graduate school here um, uh, during uh, my, my studies. And, and has continued to be um, an influence ever since, and a great help. Um, David Cowan uh, was the uh, the dean of the field of the history of pharmacy when I entered, and uh, was always very helpful and encouraging. Gave me a couple of lessons um, in in how to pursue um, the life of the historian. Uh, I give him great credit for that. James Harvey Young is another uh, influence and inspiration. And lastly, I want to mention um, uh, John Scarborough, who was here as, uh, as director of the Institute for less than a year, uh, but we were colleagues, active colleagues for several years. And um, he was always an interesting and engaging personality, someone with a great enthusiasm uh, for history and uh, especially in his own field of ancient pharmacy and medicine. So he's another name that comes to mind. Well, Greg, we know that your PhD thesis explored the professional life of William Proctor Jr., who is widely considered the father of American pharmacy. Uh, could you comment, what made this pharmacist such a seminal figure in the development of pharmacy in the United States? Well, Bill, with Proctor, especially right at the time of his death, he, he was a relatively young man when he died. He died, as they used to say back then, in harness. He had just given a lecture at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy a few hours before he died, the last, what amounted to the last lecture of, of the semester. And he was seen as a model practitioner, a very... Uh, highly ethical practitioner. He was, most importantly, a very generous and kind man. And I think that that came through. He was always helping others, helping local associations and, and such uh, get a leg up. Um, after the uh, Civil War, he reached out to the pharmacists of the South saying, come back to APHA. 
He was instrumental in getting the APHA to hold a um, one of their uh, annual meetings soon after the end of the war uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, in a sense, uh, to do that, to have that symbolic uh, uh, outreach, and he was a scholar and one and a person of of great dedication to highly professional ethical practice, and so he was um, really almost like an icon. I think that is what happened. It's, and again, because he died uh, really at the peak of, of his career, that made him, gave him a, little, a sense of sort of a heroic um, stature. Also, one of, the, one of his students uh, at, there in that last class, we had two very famous students in that last class, one of them being uh, Henry Welcome, um, who became a, an industrial a pharmacist of great renown, and also Joseph Remington. And so uh, because he had these students of, of great uh, repute, um, that again, I think they carried on um, his legacy and made sure that his name was not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Greg, thinking about um, your scholarly work, uh, how would you characterize the main thrust of your historical research, writing and speaking throughout your career up to this point? Well, Bill, uh, what I've done over the years when people ask me, what do you do or what's your work? I usually say, well, I'm a 19th century drugstore historian. That's what I do. Um, and that's been my main focus and interest is in community pharmacy practice, especially in what's sometimes called the long 19th century. That is from the, uh, right at the beginning of the 1800s up until about right after World War One. 1800 to 1920. Um, it's a time of individual achievement. Uh, it's a time of organization. It's when we get the institutions that uh, we know today so well in pharmacy, um, APHA, the schools of pharmacy, the, the major uh, old schools of pharmacy, I should say, uh, the state laws are passed, um, educational requirements come into effect. All of those things happen during that time period. And um, quite frankly, Bill, that's the, the pharmacy I'm interested in, uh, just from a day-to-day -day practice, the making of medicines um, from the gifts in a sense of the natural world. It's, it's, a, it's a transition period between the pharmacy of medieval Baghdad and, and that of, of the modern industrial world. And so it's, that's, that's the thrust I was looking at that um, that uh, that time period, and also the the professional development that occurred um, then, which was um, quite significant, uh, going from a very individualistic based um, com commercial drugstore practice up to a modern academic professional during that time period. Well, just sort of building on uh, that foundation of your primary interest, uh, uh, it, it, it interests me that you've lived through a remarkable transformation of U.S. pharmacy with respect to the focus of pharmacy education and the aspirations of our professional leaders. So I'm interested in your perspectives as a historian on this phase of pharmacy's evolution. For example, was the impetus for the changes in pharmacy over the past 50 years in any way comparable to that of previous reform movements in pharmacy? Yes, definitely. Um, changes that occurred in pharmacy, in my opinion, in, at least in the period of my own interest, were brought about by individuals, um, ambitious individuals, um, thinkers who got together and made things happen. They were practitioners and, and they made reform occur. And as much as I love pharmacy organizations and the infrastructure of the profession, it's still uh, the individual practitioners out there who make uh, uh, innovation occur. And I think that's what's happened. I mean, finally, you're right, I've lived through this period from the very beginning. In fact, my curriculum, I was there at Michigan when they finally changed the old pharmacy curriculum 
to completely uh, pursue the idea of clinical pharmacy uh, in the early 70s. So I was there um, when that happened, and it took an awfully long time for that reform to get down to uh, that reform effort to get down to the everyday practice of the pharmacist. And I think that that was, in, I would say as a historian, and I've argued this at many places, that's because the reform was done through the change of education and, rather than the change of practice. What pharmacists did in the 19th century really was to change practice, um, not wait for education to do it, but to actually do it in the pharmacies themselves. And uh, it took a whole generation of, of practitioners to come through um, to make, um, I'd say, clinical pharmacy practice a reality. And then we've seen what's happened. The last 10 years have been very uh, great acceleration in change, as you know. And um, I think that it, it took two full generations of, of pharmacists to go through and be, I'd say, trained to be able to, to um, function at the top of their license for uh, change to become common um, in everyday uh, pharmacy practice. Well, let me just build on uh, that assessment. And I'm curious, uh, in your view, does pharmacy history offer lessons for contemporary pharmacists with respect to achieving perhaps more completely, more fully the aspirations of the profession for clinical or patient care pharmacy? I think, yes, I, I'm, I've always pursued history, Bill, because I found it fascinating. And that's what, I, that's what I argue to people. I don't argue very strongly that history is a tool, even though it is one. It can be used as one. I'll let other people do that. You're a, a good uh, uh, practitioner of using history as a tool. Um, I pursue it, again, because of its uh, fascinating qualities. But I have learned a few lessons, which I've um, spoken. I remember going to the uh, the pharmacy in the 21st century conferences and telling the gathered group of folks there that you have to strike while the iron's hot. Um, Edward Parrish said that at an APHA meeting in, in the 1860s, and I think it's still true. Um, you have an idea and you've got to move on it. You have to move on things when times are good. Uh, if history's any shown us that when when community practice especially is under economic pressures, it tends um, to retrench and, and to, uh, to, to not move forward. But when times are good, it's, it's time to move uh, forward. Um, the other uh, thing I guess I would learn or, or say is the pharmacists need to trust themselves. They need to trust their leaders. They need to not to cut down their leaders and their organizations, but to support them very strongly. Uh, these are people who have dedicated their lives to the service of the profession. And I think support of uh, organizations and their leadership is very important. And uh, progress has occurred in large part because of that uh, support. Um, we can't really trust, again, in my opinion, the, uh, the corporate interests of um, no matter what they may say uh, in their advertisements to the general public and such. I think we need to um, trust ourselves and, and, our, prof and our profession um, and our leaders. Um, and we mentioned uh, mistakes to be made or less, lessons to be learned. Uh, I think of 1965. Um, and not being a provider uh, in, in, in uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, um, even though Hubert Humphrey's sitting there um, and he has a pen from, uh, from, this, from Johnson's signature on it as a pharmacist and uh, we're, we're, left, we don't, we're left out of the picture. We don't need to make that mistake again. Right. Well, Greg, I'd like to bring our conversation uh, around to the Institute specifically. I know you studied uh, the founding of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy 77 years ago, which related partly to the desire to provide a home for the renowned pharmacy historian uh, George Erdogan, who fled Nazi Germany, and partly to the ideals and aspirations of this remarkable man. What can you say about the original impetus for the Institute and how that relates to AIHP's role today? 
Well, when, you're right. The Institute was founded to give George Erdogan an academic home, a place to um, practice his um, great uh, love for the history of pharmacy, to be able to do it here. Um, otherwise, he had no real, uh, almost no other uh, financial support um, coming from Germany as a mature individual, um, as a refugee. And so the Institute was founded to give him a home, and it was founded in a way of a membership organization to support the idea of a center of accurate information about the history of pharmacy and a place that would disseminate that information uh, to the for the benefit of the profession of pharmacy in the United States. Um, he knew that there were very few pharmacists in the United States who had much knowledge of the history of pharmacy. So we could not have a scholarly association like they had in France or in Italy or in Germany. We couldn't have a group of pharmacist scholars having their own little society. We needed to have a, a, an organization made up of pharmacists who saw the value in history even though they weren't practitioners themselves. And instead, they would support the efforts of, of Erdogan to do the work of the, of the history of pharmacy. And he really worked very hard to do that, publishing articles. He would publish an article in, in a local newspaper. He would go in pharmacy journals, uh, general um, uh, short pieces in, in general readership uh, periodicals, anything to get out the message of what, uh, what pharmacists have done uh, for society over the decades. And, and he, he was a truly remarkable man, a man who knew several languages. He was a man of tremendous uh, scholarship and had great respect among general historians and medical and, and scientific historians around the world. Uh, that's why I'm sitting in the George Erdogan room right now. This exists because of his tremendous reputation and what he wanted um, the Institute to become. And um, we're still here. And in large part, it's because of his greatness. Well, as the Institute has matured over the years, it's gone through a number of phases and or changes in structure and leadership. Could you comment on this briefly and uh, give us your perspective, Greg, on the phase AIHB will be entering after your retirement from your perspective? Well, Bill, we will be going back in a sense to the model that, uh, that existed uh, with Erdogan. This has been the, the goal of this, and that is when Erdogan came in 1940, uh, became director in 1941 of the Institute, that was his basically his primary source of support, meager as it was, until he became a professor here at the University of Wisconsin in 1947. And so those two things were combined, being a professor and being the executive director of the Institute. And that was the model that continued on through Erdogan's um, tenure and also then through the tenure of Glenn Sonnedecker and, um, and John Periscodola. That is, a professor here at the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy would also be the executive director of the Institute. With John Scarborough's resignation in 1986, that model uh, ceased to exist. Scarborough remained as a professor of the history of pharmacy and I became the uh, executive director of the Institute as a, in a full-time capacity. And what's going to be happening now with the advent of of the new uh, George Erdogan chair in the history of pharmacy, uh, Pro Professor Lucas Rickert, is that he will become the historical director of the Institute and in a sense reconstitute is a way to look at it as pharmacists, we do a lot of that, um, reconstitute this old model of the historian scholar um, being the, in a sense, the supervisor of the historical programming of the Institute. And in addition, of course, we will have a new executive director of the Institute, uh, Dennis Berkey, who will run the organizational aspects of the Institute. And so we, uh, we are going to go back in a way to the old format, but in a new modern way uh, that reflects the Institute's, we hope, uh, growing 
set of programming as a pharmacy organization. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, AIHP is a, a relatively small organization in terms of membership, resources, and programs, which some might say uh, parallels the overall marginal interest in the profession's history among practitioners, educators, association leaders in pharmacy today. Nevertheless, uh, the Institute is blessed with a solid core of supporters uh, who believe it is important not only to sustain, but also to expand the Institute's work. Greg, in your view, uh, why is it important to ensure that AIHP stays alive and well? For me personally, of course, you mentioned my father and my grandfather and, and all those who went before them, uh, practitioners of pharmacy who provided such great service to society over the centuries. And that is um, in large part why, in my opinion, the Institute must survive, is to remember this, these, these achievements so that, so that they're not forgotten. That's one aspect of it. Also, we provide, the Institute that is, a whole different way of looking at pharmacy for pharmacists of all generations. And that is take a humanistic look at a very scientific based profession. Uh, we, we allow people to sort of stretch their intellect. We provide um, the bases of ethical discussions. His, history is a great way to discuss and debate um, ethical decisions that have uh, taken place in the past and the present and the future. Um, that's just a couple of, of reasons why the Institute's important. And I would say it's especially important as we move on to a whole new paradigm of pharmacy practice to remember where we've come from. That I've often suggested over these decades is why we've struggled uh, with getting membership um, and getting numbers. Our members that we have are, we have a really wonderful, solid uh, group of members that have been with us for many, many years. And I thank them deeply uh, for their commitment to the Institute and what we've done. And I think that we can really serve a function um, when we are going through this paradigm shift uh, and it's completed. Because I, in contrast to medicine, where the actual paradigm of practice has not changed over these over these last several decades, it, we've had several uh, I should say several, but we've had a few very significant changes in pharmacy, and that is, as I've argued often, why I believe it's been difficult to get people, um, younger people, interested in the history of pharmacy because they're looking forward at a different kind of practice than occurred in the past. Um, very, very, uh, very different style of practice. Um, although I'll tell you this, Bill, I just ran into a bunch of uh, UW pharmacy alums from uh, at, a, at a recent uh, gathering, and boy, are they interested in history now. Um, they weren't when I knew them as students here. Um, as I was a TA in their dispensing lab, but now, uh, now they're all very interested in it as their hair is gray. And um, and they're looking back, and so um, that's another uh, another reason why we have to stay around, and so so that pharmacists of the future know uh, that um, there'll be a historical society for them to join and to learn more about their past and the, the great past of the profession. Right. Well, I guess we could also mention um, you know, history of our profession as a tool. You know, lessons. Uh, that can be learned that perhaps has some application today in, uh, in the advances uh, we're trying to make. I know that's not your main area of interest, but uh, as you pointed out, it's one of my interests and I think uh, the Institute is quite valuable in that regard. Uh, Greg, as we uh, draw our conversation to a close here, uh, give us a sense of your professional and personal plans after retirement as executive director. Uh, yes, Bill. Well, I plan to be spending uh, time right in this room here in the Erdong Room. Um, as a Fashela Scholar, I'm going to be here available to, uh, to answer queries that come in, to do to, uh, small amounts of research, to write uh, small pieces for Pharmacy and History and other, our website and other AIHP publications. Um, 
I'm also going to be working here at the School of Pharmacy in a, in a very limited part-time capacity, working in our historical collections. And I hope to be with some of these books you see behind me, uh, taking these, uh, reorganizing uh, our collections here to make them uh, more useful for visiting scholars. And uh, so that's one aspect of what I'll be doing professionally is working with our collections. I just visited with our uh, health sciences history librarian a couple of hours ago and talked about a, a very fascinating project that we're hoping to work on uh, that deals with uh, medical and pharmaceutical advertising um, from journals, scanning these ads, making them available to scholars worldwide with a lot of good metadata, which is what uh, historians um, um, live and die by. So um, that's just just to give you a little tip of the iceberg, but I'm, I, I'm surely not going to be leaving town. Uh, this is my home, and um, I, I really couldn't leave the collections uh, behind. Well, Greg, I know you well enough uh, to uh, appreciate that your interests are really quite uh, multidimensional, and I know you have a couple of passions, at least a couple outside of pharmacy. Could you com comment on that briefly, and are you looking forward to spending more time in some of those areas? I, yes, Bill. Uh, when the weather is nice, I plan to spend much of my time cycling um, uh, as much as long as my body holds out. Uh, do that um, in the Madison area, which is full of beautiful bike trails and bike paths and such. Uh, I have a recumbent bicycle, so I'm one of those uh, odd ducks, which won't surprise people out there who know me well. Um, so that's one thing I will be doing. Also, I will be pursuing uh, my interest in music. I play in a big band, uh, plays jazz music. I also play in a Baroque recorder ensemble and um, have a great interest in early music. That is early music that was written before uh, 1750. And uh, I don't think I've told you this yet, Bill, but I've already been recruited to serve on two boards of of directors of organizations that deal with uh, early music. And so I will be spending some of my spare time um, doing uh, that work here. And uh, one of those is the Madison Early Music Festival, which takes place in July every year. And I want to encourage everyone out there who's interested <laughs> in early music to uh, consider coming to Madison for the Madison Early Music Festival. Oh, and lastly, Bill, you mentioned that. I, I don't want to forget um, that I'll be, of course, working on uh, the upcoming Congress for the History of Pharmacy, which will be taking place in Washington, D.C. in early September of 2019. Um, I'll be giving a talk there, and I'll be helping out with the planning, and um, I'm very much looking forward to welcoming people from all over the world to come to the Capitol Hilton in downtown Washington for the Congress. So that's something else that's going to be taking some of my um, um, spare time. Okay. Well, Greg, uh, thank you very much for speaking with me. Uh, I think your comments help us deepen our appreciation for the history of pharmacy, for the work of AIHB, and for your immense contributions to this field. Uh, we greatly appreciate your longstanding dedication to preserving, studying, and communicating the history of pharmacy. So please accept our deepest congratulations on your career and best wishes for the future. Thank you, Bill. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share a little bit today. And um, this is just the beginning of uh, phase three, I guess, of my history of pharmacy career. And I'm very much looking forward to it and my continued involvement with the Institute.